it had been a while since Michigan's last national title in football, 49 years to be exact. That was until 1997. Over the following weeks, we will help tell the story about how the maize and blue climbed to the top of the college football mountain as they won the 1997 national championship. I'll tell you about a team that went from Michigan men to Michigan legends as an important chapter in college football history came to a close. This is Road to the Victors, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. I'm your host, Andrew Hammond, assistant sports editor at the Detroit Free Press. To celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Michigan Wolverines national title, the Free Press is publishing a commemorative book, Hail Yes, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. You can pre-order the book at um.pictorial.book.com. The 1997 season is significant for many reasons. It is the last season that we will see the traditional pole and bowl system that decided football's national champion. It is the Wolverines entering the 1997 season coming off of four straight, four lost seasons, the latter two, with Lloyd Carr at the helm. Yet, this team is full of talent. From John Jansen and Jeff Backus to the dynamic triple threat that is Charles Woodson, and some kid out of California who would become the greatest quarterback in NFL history, Tom Brady. This week's guest is is Nick Katsunika. Nick covered the Wolverines for the Michigan Daily and Washington Post that season. Later, he would go on to be a writer at the Free Press. In this episode, we're going to talk about what the vibe was like and the build-up to Michigan's historic 1997 season. Nick, if you could, take me back to the 1997 season, and what do you remember most about that year? Uh, magic surprises. Uh, I don't think anybody thought that that team was going to go undefeated and win the national championship, or at least a share of it. Uh, I mean, to go undefeated, to have the Heisman Trophy winner, the first Heisman Trophy winner was primarily a defensive player, to win the Rose Bowl in dramatic, controversial fashion, uh, and to go undefeated, I think, was just incredible. And this is a team that had to have a lot of things go right. Um, you know, had a coach who was, um, you know, underappreciated, we'll say a quarterback who was underappreciated, uh, a defense that was one of the greatest of all time, a Heisman trophy winner. I mean, it's just, just an unbelievable, memorable season. And that's why we're here doing a podcast, uh, a quarter century later. Absolutely. And, and and the 1997 season is so fascinating for so many reasons. Uh, it would be the last time that a national title was decided by a vote in the coaches or a P poll in 1998. This new system, because we are in the computer age, it's called the Bowl Championship Series. It would put various bowls in a system that would achieve the objective that we have basically been trying to solve since 1936, 1920, something, it, a long time. Uh, and that is crafting a true national champion. For the younger people out there listening to this, we just let us help describe how things were for 60 years. And it was just, yeah, this is, we've, we accepted this weird system where at the end of the season, it was decided sometimes even before the Bulls, who the national champion was. And in the 90s, people got more sophisticated because they saw just how screwed up the actual system was, but nobody did anything about it until the mid to late 90s. Well, I would say we still don't have a true national (laughs) champion, right? Like this is not basketball where you have a bracket and you have a true playoff uh, and, and, you know, everybody basically gets a fair shot, right? This is still determined by polls, you know, and by a committee uh, that decides who's going to be in the playoff, right? But you do have one versus two. So the way I would look at it is think of how controversial it is now. And now just imagine that 
all right, who's the national champion? Let's put it up for a vote, right? And not everybody plays each other. Um, and so you just basically have a vote of the the media, which is the AP poll that determines the AP version of the national championship. And then you have the coaches poll, which is the coaches, uh, and they determine their uh, vote for the national champion, right? So I think it's fitting that in the 1997 season, which is sort of the last under that system, that you had a split national champion, right? So Michigan gets a share. Nebraska gets a share. I think Michigan fans would say that it was ridiculous that Nebraska with retiring Tom Osborne gets a share. And I think Nebraska fans would say, hey, we, we should have settled it on the field. We would have beat you. So um, I don't know. It's it's funny to look back on that, that that's how it was determined, but that's how it was. Absolutely. And when we get back, we will talk about how this 1997 Michigan squad came to be. You are listening to Road to the Victors, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. We are back with Road to the Victors, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. Now, Nick, uh, the the Michigan program under Lloyd Carr, uh, after taking over for Gary Moeller, he's, he's kind of sort of a... a I would consider a polarizing figure in the history of Michigan football. Even with the national championship, uh, he was a longtime assistant for both Gary Moeller and, of course, Bo Schimbeckler. Uh, what are your memories about the beginning of the Carr era uh, from how he, get, how he got the job to where he is entering 97? Well, I don't trust my memory, and I don't think anybody else should either. And I was there. Right. Um, I think your memories, you know, get screwed up over the years because now, you know, he won a national championship. Now, you know, he coached a Heisman Trophy winner. Now, you know, he coached Tom Brady and had some other successful seasons. And you forget where things were really in 1995. Um, So Gary Moeller, there's an incident at a restaurant where he gets drunk, um, you know, and we don't need to get into details of that, but he loses his job. And he's Lloyd Carr's close friend or best friend. Uh, it's splattered all over the media. It's a big uh, issue, right? And I'm the the summer sports editor of the Michigan Daily, the student newspaper, uh, and I write the lead story, May 17th, 1995. And my lead is this, the new era of Michigan football may have to wait. Um, you know, the Wolverines' next head coach will not be named until after the 1995 season. Lloyd Carr was an interim coach. He was a placeholder, and that's not my view of it. That was the athletic director's view of it. And the way that Joe Roberson, the athletic director, introduced Lloyd Carr as the head coach for that season was that he was an interim. Uh, He said that his short list did not match up to the media's short list, um, and uncertainty was bad. And this is a direct quote. He goes, you know, I want the players to no longer have to wait for the press to speculate on who the next coach will be. I'm trying to reduce the speculation and the pressure on me. The pressure to rush this decision was totally unreasonable. By waiting a year, I can make my short list a longer list. So Lloyd Carr is introduced to the public, to the fans, to the media as a placeholder. He's going to hold down the fort for a year till we figure out who the coach is going to be, right? (laughs) And this is these are the names that were in the media: Colorado coach Bill McCartney, Redskins quarterbacks coach Cam Cameron, and Vikings assistant coach Tony Dungy. And those may have been unrealistic, but that's who people wanted or thought they would go after, right? This is the Michigan standard. If you're a Michigan fan, the Michigan arrogance. If you're not a Michigan fan. But people wanted like the best coach or the new hot thing. Lloyd Carr hadn't been a head coach since Westland John Glenn in the 70s. He was a longtime assistant. He was a placeholder, right? So you really have to go back to that to understand how perceptions of Lloyd Carr were colored at that time. You know, they have four straight four loss seasons going into 1997, right? Lloyd ends up getting the head coaching job. Um, and losing to Penn State right after that, um, they hadn't had great success under him or or even under Gary Moeller before that. So there was really no indication going into 1997 that this was the coach who was going to lead them to their first national championship since 1948. 
to go undefeated, something that Bo Schembechler had never done. There was really no, no one knew that this was going to happen. And I think it's a credit to Lloyd Carr. It's a credit to the Michigan football program and all the players that, that, that it did happen. Um, but I don't think anybody expected that it would. I'm I'm still not over the fact that you said Vikings assistant head coach Tony Dungy. Like there's this weird type of like butterfly effect moment in sports that you have thinking, oh my God, what if Tony Dungy takes the Michigan job? What if he's what if he's offered and accepts the Michigan job? You don't have the you, you may not have the Vikings, you know, defense that goes, you know, that turns into the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. You don't have so many things that happens, and that's just one of those. Wow. Yeah, but I but, don't know if it was realistic. I don't right. know if he was really on their list. I don't know if he would have taken the job. The point is that that's who the media put out there. Right. That's who who was on the wish list. And as that pertains to Lloyd Carr, Lloyd Carr was on no one's wish list. They wish they they wish he would have left, including including the athletic directors. (laughs) Right. Like, let's be real. Like he was not introduced as this is our guy. Right. This is our guy. He's going to lead this program. He's going to take over for Gary Moeller. And he's 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 the guy. It was here's Lloyd Carr. He's going to like, you know hold down the fort for a while I to reduce the pressure on me and keep you guys at bay and I'll figure this out. Right. Like that's <laughs> literally how the AD, you know, projected this to everyone. And like, here's a quote from Jarrett Irons, Michigan linebacker under the circumstances, Carr is the best man for the job. Not like, <laughs> wow. He's our guy. We love look coach Carr. It was, yeah, you know what? This is a tough situation. This guy's been here. You know what? So, you need to understand that. So, like, in fairness to sort of the media and the fans, like, that was Michigan's projection of Lloyd Carr. Right. But um, I think that that adds to the story as we know what the ending is now, right? Right. Like, the fact that tells you what Lloyd Carr had to overcome internally and externally, um, and I include myself in the externally. Like, I was a critic of his. Like, I was like any other Michigan student. I wanted the best coach. Right. Like I'm a Michigan student. I, I have high standards and I want the best coach. I don't want some assistant who's been here just getting a job just because. Right. Right. Like I was one of those people. I was one of those voices in the student paper. And I look back on some things I wrote today and I kind of cringe because uh, now I know how how it turned out. But I didn't know that. then. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then there's also a change in the Big Ten at the time. You have. Penn State, who had been a mainstay as an independent, entering the league in 1993, uh, and within two years, they're fighting for a national championship with the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Then you also have a a program like Wisconsin, who I wouldn't necessarily call them a sleeping giant, but they finally, like, just the ball finally bounced their way. And then, of course, you have the Cinderella run of Northwestern in 1995. So not only do you have a a coach in in kind of transition, but you have a conference in transition as well. It's no longer the big two and the little, you know, eight. Yeah, and, and that's certainly part of the story. Michigan had a brutal schedule. Uh, the conference was strong. Um, again, I don't trust my own memory. Like, I know I didn't have high standards for Michigan or high expectations for Michigan that season. But I go back and I pull out the uh, preview issue of the Michigan Daily for the 1997 season. I'm like, hey, where did I pick Michigan that year? Fifth, right? And I wasn't alone. Another one of the Michigan Daily writers picked them fifth. Two others picked them third. No one had them win in the Big Ten, let alone win the national title, Right. So you've got Penn State in there, coached by Joe Paterno, powerhouse. Uh, Northwestern had come back from, I think, a 16-0 deficit to beat Michigan the year before. Um, Purdue had beaten them on, uh, you know, in a game that I think Michigan fans would rather forget. Um, it was going to be hard enough just to win the Big Ten, uh, let alone go undefeated and win the national championship. And And, and it's crazy that 
in a season where so many things had to go their way, as you as you mentioned earlier, so many things had to go their way. Oh, oh, you have, you have we have a point here. Here we go. Sorry, I just forgot. Like you got to remember who's the coach at Michigan State. Then? Oh yeah, some guy named Nick Saban. Uh, That's yeah. right. Yeah, he got Nick Saban at Michigan State. Noted Browns Paterno. assistant Nick Saban. Yeah, like, <laughs> like you got Joe Paterno at. Uh, you know, Penn State. Now, Ohio State's John Cooper, which uh, that's a different story, which I'm sure we'll get into later. <laughs> later podcast. That not so bad for Michigan. But, um, you know, it was it was a tough conference. It was a tough situation. Leave it at that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when we come back, we will talk about uh, another moment in the preseason for Michigan. Uh, some words in the media from a Michigan alum coming up on Road to the Victors. The story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. Nick, we have covered everything but the lead up to the 1997 season. Now, the Sporting News shed some light on Michigan in their preseason preview. One of the feature stories, and one of the stories that was actually featured on the cover, was written by Michigan alum Michael Bradley. He called Michigan, in his words, not mine, a withering national power, and a school that looked like a corporation that had lost a lucrative patent and was unprepared to handle the hungry competition banging on the marketplace door. That's a, that's a very sophisticated way of saying uh, y'all are not good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's right. And that's why I say, you know, you need to go back and read things at the time. And I read some things that I wrote and I cringe. Um, But that supports what I'm saying is that, you know, that was the view of Michigan and it wasn't just the media. So the same thing that I referenced before, Joe Roberson, the AD, had spoken to Joe Paterno, head coach at Penn State, for advice about how to handle the situation. One thing Paterno told him was that Michigan cannot afford to slip into mediocrity. Facts. That's a quote. Okay. That's from Joe Paterno, right? Not, you know, some guy, some writer, some journalist. That's from Joe Paterno, okay? They'd lost, they'd had four straight, well, leading up to 97, they had four straight, four loss seasons. So they're in the middle of this run where M started to stand for mediocrity, okay? So now I'm going to take you back to Lloyd Carr, his press conference before his first game as a Michigan head coach, right? So we just went over how he was hired, how he was presented to the media, uh, at the Detroit Athletic Club in downtown Detroit by Comerica Park, um, where Comerica Park is today. It wasn't then. <laughs> um, you know, he has a uh, a press conference with George Welsh, the Virginia coach, to set up the Pigskin Classic. And what Lloyd Carr says is, Michigan will be back. The, <laughs> even he recognized the program wasn't where it needed to be. Right. right? But he said, Michigan will be back. And I just find that really interesting in retrospect because he ended up being the coach who brought Michigan back and brought Michigan back to national championship uh, status, yeah, right? Absolutely. But at that time, Michigan wasn't there. The view of alums and, and the media, like you just pointed out, was was very sour and very negative. Um, and as it pertains to the 97 season, this is everything that Michigan had to overcome, right? And everything that Michigan did overcome. It's crazy, it, 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 and it's it's so wild that you know the expectations for Michigan, and really just for any Power Five, and as long as you know, if you are a somewhat good Power Five, the expectations are always going to be there. I think we and the listeners understand that, but for some schools, it just seems like in Michigan, which is ironic in Lloyd Carr's case. It's never enough, even with the national title. It is never enough. And I feel like even in today's college football, it's even worse because, you know, you could go to the Rose Bowl in 1997. Yay, hooray, we do this. But you go to the Rose Bowl now. Okay, yay, hooray. What are you doing two or three years down the road? It's it's absolutely insane. Yeah, I mean, the current system now, it's all that matters is a national championship, right? And what's interesting about this team, too, is a, sort of a sidebar, is Lloyd Carr was sort of anti-playoff. 
And even though they were 11 and 0 going into the Rose Bowl, he was talking about the Rose Bowl, winning the Rose Bowl. Like his his focus was never on the national championship. It was on winning the Big Ten, going to the Rose Bowl, um, sort of the old school perspective. And, you know, there's something quaint about that. And there's something to say about that where, you know, like the national championship is out of your control, right? It's up to voters. What's in your control is winning the games in front of you, winning the Big Ten, winning the Rose Bowl, right? And he's right about that. And there was something kind of nice about that system. But what also, what a quarter century later puts into perspective is that, look, this was their first national championship since 1948. It's their only national championship since 1948, 25 years later. And there's two ways to look at that, that, you know, Michigan still isn't where Michigan fans want it to be. It hasn't been for a very long time now. This is not Alabama. It's not Clemson. It's not even Ohio State. Sorry. And I'm a Michigan alum. But in the context of the 1997 season, that's how special 1997 was. Everything had to go right. Pretty much everything did go right. It was a magical year and the only year since 1948 that that, that happened for Michigan. With all of this discussion about what's wrong with Michigan, clearly something was right because to start the season, they ranked 14th in the preseason AP poll and 13th in the coaches poll. A whopping seven of Michigan's opponents in 1997 started the season ranked in at least one of the polls. Penn State, Colorado, Ohio State, Notre Dame, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Michigan State. One of these teams leads off our second episode next week and the first game of the 1997 season for the Michigan Wolverines. The Colorado Buffaloes return to Ann Arbor, the scene of one of that program's greatest triumphs, Cordell Stewart's Hail Mary in 1994. Slash is gone, but are the Buffaloes still a national title contender? Anjanette Delgado and Kirkland Crawford are the executive producers of this podcast. Carrie Jr. II provides technical support. Peter Batia is the editor of the Detroit Free Press. And I'm Andrew Hammond, your host. You can find Road to the Victors on Freep.com slash podcasts and Apple, Spotify, or your streaming app of choice. Please subscribe, leave a rating, and tell your friends about us. It really does help. We will be back next week as we officially begin the 1997 Michigan football season with Colorado at the Big House. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week.